good morning. Welcome to Sulphur Springs Baptist Church. Amen. And that song she's playing is When I See the Blood, number 58 in the All-American Hymnal. If you want to take the book and turn to that, we'll see if we can sing that this morning. When I See the Blood, that's what's going to happen when you see it. Amen.
Thank you, Sister Catherine. Great singing, great songs, and a great. First Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, this could be a little different message. I'm not. I'm not even sure where I'm going to start. Where I'm going. To, how am I even going to get into this? To be honest with you. Uh, I've just got some thoughts rumbling around my mind. I'm going to try to get them out today. We live. We live. Uh, I'm assuming. Uh, Having not, you know, lived in all the years past. <laughs> But we've got to be living in some of the most exciting times from a biblical perspective uh, of any time that I, that I can tell. We've got to be so close to our Lord's coming. We just sang about it. When we see Jesus coming in glory. Now, ain't all we're going to see, but we're going to see Him. Yes. Uh, he, we're going to meet him in the sky. He, we're going to go home and be with him. That rapture of the church is real, folks. Amen. Uh, God's word's true about the moment. Twinkly and I, we're all going to be changed. Uh, it tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, we're going down to the reed, but it tells us that the moment of twinkly and I, that's, a, that's, just a, that's just a reflection of light out of your eye. That's how quick it's going to happen. Now, I don't know what kind of excuse the world's going to come up with for our disappearance, but it'll be some kind of a lie oh, yeah. that the world will swallow hook, line, and sinker. But then Jesus is going to come again, and he's going to come in in power and glory. Yes. He's going to come with great power and glory at the second coming. And the world will tremble at his coming. Uh, we're rejoicing, looking for that blessed hope. Amen. But I just, I just look at everything that's going on. I mean, who would have thunk it? Amen. Uh, just, a, just a few years, a few years ago, that we would live in a society uh, where people don't know whether they're he's or she's or it. Yeah. Where governments are fighting to make it law for them to not know whether they're a he, she, or an it. Mm. Who would have thunk it? But Jesus thought it. Matthew 24, you go where you begin to look around in, in uh, his teaching on the last day. He says, It wasn't the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. So shall it be in the coming of the days of Son of Man. Now, Luke 24, or Matthew 24, all deals, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, I think it is, all deal with the second coming of Jesus. But if the rapture occurs before that, then we've got to got to really kind of get kind of excited thinking about it. Because that means we're just that much closer to Christ coming for his church. And then I, I got uh, uh, to reading about the, in Alaska they're worried about the icebergs melting. <laughs> and the polar bears don't have some place to, to hang out, you know. And But they've got to digging around into the permafrost and they're They've dug tunnels in Fairbanks, where they've got tunnels dug underneath the, the permafrost. And it's thawing out. And they're wondering why it's thawing out. I said, well, you, you idiots, you dug a, a tunnel, there's warm air coming. Well, anyway. <laughs> they're going down in there, and, they're, and they're, they're finding living organisms that have been frozen in this ice. But there's not only living organisms, but there is... There is uh, viruses that have been frozen into this. And I was reading an article there this morning. It said, well, maybe the next great pandemic is going to come out of the frozen Arctic. So the ground is going to thaw out and some plague is going to pop up out of the ground. They found down inside there are also bacterial viruses like anthrax. Interesting. And it's thawing out. Do you ever read over in the book of Revelation where it talks about those plagues God's going to send down upon the earth? It's going to, they're going to fall. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe God's just going to dump it out on them. I don't know. But we're living in exciting times when the things that have been prophesied in the Bible are, 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 are facts today. Well, you can't buy or sell when the Antichrist comes into power. Everybody's going to have to have a mark on their hand. We live in the age of the cryptocurrency. We have, 
You know, we don't, I don't use cash very much. We, we put everything usually on our card, then we get it, then we pay it off. It's just easier for us that way. Don't even write checks on it. But there's already 141 countries. 141 countries make up 96% of the gross national product of the world that are dealing with cryptocurrencies, that digital currency. China's already using it. The United States is moving to do it because they're afraid China will now begin to be able to set the value of currency. So they're going to move to a digital currency trying to get there ahead of them. That means that somewhere along the line, everything that you buy can be tracked. Uh, I was listening to a conversation on the radio going, going up to Moberly this week to uh, put on mud and uh, they was talking about the, the cryptocurrency and they, they were saying that that uh, when this thing got in that they, they would be able to track everything that you buy and the, the guy was on the show he said if I go out and buy a stick of gum they're going to be able to know they'll know exactly where you bought that stick of gum how much you paid for it. And interesting that they want to do this, though, to preserve our societies. Uh, because it will stabilize our, our financial uh, institutions that are caving in. <laughs> it, will, it will help prevent crime. Because if you don't deal in cash, sorry drug dealers. <laughs> what are you going to do? You're going to put it on your little cryptocurrency card and well, now we know who to go look for, right? If they can track you buying a piece of gum, you go out and buy drugs, you're, you're in the same... We live in that, that time when, when everything within the Bible is, that says it's going to be there is going to be there. Is, is at hand. We see, we see Israel rising up over there. Now, when I get done saying all this, I'm going to press with the fact that this doesn't mean that Jesus is coming back any time soon. I don't know. There's a lot of people who do this. And they'll start picking dates and say he's going to come back here. He's going to come back here because all this is happening. A few years ago, I don't know if y'all remember this, but there was buzzards. Uh, just uh, these vultures and eagles was, was just populating like crazy over in Israel. And everybody got, to, oh, we, we got it. Because Jesus said, wherever the vultures and the eagles gather, that, that's where the last time's going to be. And so it has to be. Well, the vultures and eagles are all gone now, so... What happened to their prophecy? Well, they don't know that. People get out and they make, make stupid decisions for God. You know, well, God, you've got to come here because this is happening. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. It could get a whole lot worse, and I think it will get a whole lot worse. But the rapture is no sign as far. It can happen right now. Yes. Wouldn't interrupt God's schedule at all. So we live in that, that, that uh, tech Techno, techno, what do they call that? Tech, I know it's technology, but it's techno something. Age where everybody is hooked up with their computers and the World Wide Web and all of the other stuff. And, and people's lives are consumed, consumed with this electronic stuff. I, I, uh, it, it, it just, does, it never ceases to amaze me. To go into a McDonald's or a, a diner somewhere, anywhere, it don't matter where you go. And you'll sit down and, and every table, every person has one of them phones in their hands and they're sitting there pushing buttons and they're, yeah. they're all connected. They're sitting right there. They got people sitting across from them. They could be talking to, having a conversation with them. I watched a young, a young boy and a young girl. Now, I'm hoping that they were probably related. <laughs> If it wasn't, there ain't going to be much hope for their future. I bet it is. But they're sitting there. She's on one side, he's on the other side, and they're sitting there in their boat. Unless they're texting or talking with each other on this thing, there's no conversation going on between the two of them. So we live in a, in a world that, that is getting more used and more used to being digitalized or being separated by our technology instead of unified. Instead of having people in a society who actually deal with each other. 
We live in a society that, that is looking to control. It doesn't matter what. It, we, we've seen the major. I mean, we, we've seen how easy it was during, during COVID. It doesn't take just a little bit of promotion. Fear builds up. People are scared to death. Wear one mask, two masks, a dozen masks. No mask. Take the jab. Don't take the jab. We, we live with people who live on the edge of fear. And anytime they can build fear, they can control the people. And that was, that was just proved. Just proved. Scary thought at how easily we think, oh, there's got to be some kind of a great, great happening. Something's really got to shake the world up for the Antichrist to come in and come into power. No, just a little bit of fear. Yeah. And people will follow it, hook, line, and sink. So we live, we live in a in a, a a crazy, crazy age, crazy world age, I guess. But then, what ought our priorities to be? What ought our priorities to be? Oh, we just can't. Let's do it. Get up work. We get to work. Well, Jesus coming. Is he coming today? Is he coming tomorrow? Is, is the second coming? Are we going to go through the tribulation? Because people are looking at it and say, boy, this looks like we're going to wind up into the seven years of the tribulation because church isn't gone yet. And all these things haven't happened that we think ought to happen. And so people are getting all... You're finding every kind of weird, strange doctrine. The church is about as messed up as I know that you can get a church messed up. And I'm talking about the worldwide church right now. Of all denominations and faiths, you bump them all together. It is a putrefied, boiling mess. They've thrown the book out the window. They've thrown Christ out the window. They've thrown God out the back door. They've embraced the socialism and society as the rules of how they function as a church. So what ought we to be doing? Well, I for one am excited. I, I, I really believe Jesus. I believe we're that generation that's going to, going to see Christ come. We're going to be called up out here. I, I believe that. I believe it can happen today. But it may not happen today. I believe it can happen tomorrow. I was looking for it to happen last year. It didn't happen. So what do I do? I just sit around for a little my thumbs waiting for Jesus to come. No. There is some priorities in a Christian's life that ought to be put into order and we ought to be living it. There's some first things that ought to be first. I was looking over here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15 as the Apostle Paul was preaching the gospel and uh, he, he, came, he came down through there and he says these words in, in verse 3 uh, preaching about the gospel. He said, I declare unto you the gospel in verse 1. He said, which I preached unto you. And then look down at verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all. Do you know that there is a priority uh, in your life and a priority in the church's life and a priority in, in the giving out of the gospel? Above all other things, that which is first of all. That which is first of all in my life, I need to be saved. I need to be saved by the blood of Christ. I need to be saved by the death, the burial, and the resurrection. To put my faith into Christ. Without that, I'm lost without any hope. The first thing that every person needs is to be saved by the grace of God. Jesus said to Nicodemus, a religious leader, by the way, you must be born again. Your problem, Nicodemus, is that you're, that you're still the old creature. You need to be made into a new creature. Now, Nicodemus understand it. He told me, so, well, it's a spiritual birth. The wind blows where it will. The Spirit comes through it. The, it is a spiritual work of God in your life that transforms you from the old person to the new person. When, God, when you get saved, you'll no longer be the same person you used to be. Now, you still have the same body, and it's going to take a while to work off some of those rough edges, but I promise you, God is at work roughing or smoothing out those rough edges. 
If the day you got saved, you're still doing the same things that you did back when you got saved, then there's a problem with your salvation. God changes those whom He saves. We take off, and he, He requires of you to get into His Word, to study, to take off the old man, to put on the new. To allow Him to do something in your life. But there is a priority, and that is, first of all, the gospel. You've got to get that right. And we live in a world today where people are all excited. Well, you know, what prophecy? Give me Bible prophecy. Teach me Bible prophecy. You know, teach, teach me all the signs. Teach me all the wonders. There is no signs or wonders when, uh, before the rapture of the church takes place. It's just going to happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And it's going to be over, and you're not going to have time to get saved. In fact, the Bible says that if you miss the rapture, and you've heard the gospel, you're going to die in your sins, and you'll be damned to hell because of it. So there's a priority. You've got to get saved. Amen. Now once you're saved, then there is that need then to build yourself up in your most holy faith. We were studying uh, this morning the book of Jude. God didn't expect you to stay where you're at when you're saved. When God plants a tree, He expects it to grow. When He puts that seed of life in you, He expects for that fruit of life to come out of you. When He... When you become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, He expects the fruit of the Spirit then to become part of your life. For you to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So well, how do I do that? Well, you read the Bible. Let me, let me just put it right down there where the rubber meets the road. The problem with most Christians is, is they don't read this book. They have no idea. They have no idea what's in this book. This is the most fascinating book that has ever been, been delivered into the hands of man by the hand of God Himself. Amen. It had, you, you will never, you will never, 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 and I say this without any fear of, of being wrong, you will never exhaust the truth that's in this book. You would have to exhaust God to be able to uncover all the truths that's in this book. I read stuff... It just, I look at it and I just, I, it, Lord, I said, that's so far over my head. I ain't even beginning to think about that. <laughs> I just go on until he gives me some more light on it. Yep. Amen. Yep. People, they just close up the book, leave it lay somewhere. They never read it. It's not a part of their daily life. They don't get up. You know, you know how long it takes to read this book? It takes you five chapters a day. You can be through it. You can be through it twice in a year. Three chapters a day gets you through it once a day. Is that, is that just overwhelming? Is that, is that something we just can't make enough time for? Have you ever read this thing front to back? Have you ever started in Genesis, went all the way to Revelation? Have you, do you do that on a yearly basis? When I got saved, I'll never forget this book. When I, when I picked it up and I started reading it, there was something different about this book. Yes. And I began to read that thing and I couldn't put it down. I just read it and read it and read it. And, and ever since I've been saved, I've got through this book at least once a year. I've been through it as many times as three times in a year. And I've preached through it and I've, and I've studied through it. You can't exhaust what's in here. The truths that lie in it, man still trying to figure out in this world that we live in. All of the, the ills for society are found in here. All of the, the cures for the ills of society are found in here. But the book stays closed, and we wonder why our world doesn't change. We live in a world where people look up for people. They, well, if I like this person, or I get that person into office, or I, I do this, and he'll, he'll, he'll stand behind the things that I believe in. We don't even know what we believe in most of the time. Much less like somebody else who don't care anything about what you believe in. Just how many votes can I get? I'm going to tell you something. The only thing that's going to count in this world is a person who is saved by the gospel of the grace of God. 
who is saved by the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, covered in His blood, secured for all eternity, and who can read this book and know and understand it. Amen. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy, Study, study to show thyself approved. A workman rightly dividing this book. You know why we get so many weird doctrines in this world? They don't divide this book yeah. correctly. They want to take things like Matthew 24 and apply it to the church. They don't apply it to the church. That's the second coming. We're gone by the time Matthew 24 gets here. Amen. Know this book. Know your Savior. Know the book. Know your Savior and know the book. And then finally turn over to the book of Titus. That's at the end of the T section. First, second. That is only first, second Timothy. Titus. Drop over to about chapter, where am I wanting that here? Chapter 2. Verse 11, chapter 2. Now we covered a little bit of this this morning. Chapter 2 uh, begins off with, Speak thou of things which become a sound doctrine. And I said that this morning, I said everybody just went to sleep on me. <laughs> Do doctrine doctrine is, is, is that study of the Word of God. Yes. Knowing what it teaches. You ought to know that. You ought to know that. What does our church believe? What, what do we believe? It's in our Constitution. You ought to be able to read it. Oh, I know them people are weird. <laughs> but I want you to look at verse 11. Now, Titus is given a whole list of things down through here. Talking about sound speech, talking about the doctrine, talking about exhorting. Servants to be obedient to their masters, not purloining, uh, showing all good fidelity, adorning the doctrine of uh, God our Savior in all things. I like that, adorning the doctrine of God. We ought to wear it gracefully. We ought to wear it gracefully. But look at verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. There's not going to be one person that the flood's not going to swallow up who have not heard Noah preaching about the righteousness of God. There will not be people in this last day who will not know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when that flood comes, they'll believe the lie because they wouldn't believe the truth. Yes. It's appeared to all men. He wasn't hidden. Hadn't been hidden for all these years. It's been preached and preached and wrote about all the... All the libraries of all the world couldn't hold all the books that have been written about Christ. It wouldn't hold all of them that ought to be written about Christ. We get our, unfortunately, instead of getting our doctrine from the Word of God, we usually go to the movies. I mean, you, you talk about the Exodus. Most people know about the Exodus because they watch it on TV. But that grace has appeared, our salvation, that which is first of all, then that which is second of all, that of giving ourselves to know God. That gospel teaches us some things. It teaches us, in verse 12, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust. There's just some things as a Christian you've got to deny. Yes. Yes. Said, so, no, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't adorn the gospel of Christ. It brings shame upon Christ. It can bring reproach upon His name. And I'm not going to do it. He says we ought to live soberly. Now that, that might be true for a lot of people, period. Just need to put the bottle down. There's a reason uh, we, we teach against the drinking of alcohol. That's, you just ought, to, ought, you ought not do it. It's not... It's not given unto princes and it's not given to kings to, to drink wine, to drink alcoholic beverages. The Bible teaches clearly that those that do are deceived and are not wise. Amen. 
Uh, it says we're not to look upon it when it stirreth itself in the cup. That's that, that's, that's that uh, fermentation that takes place with it. But that's not what I'm preaching about this morning. <laughs> Soberly, that means you need to be thinking straight. Not silly-headed, silly-minded. But to be sober about the things of Christ in your life. To think, well, you know, maybe tomorrow I'll try this. No, you do it today. Be sober-minded about those things. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present. There you are. That's what the gospel ought to produce in your life. When you're, when you're before Christ comes, because when He comes, you're going to go into His presence, but you're also going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. At that judgment seat of Christ, you're going to give an account of how you've lived, good or bad. Now, thank God your salvation isn't on judgment term. You're on a foundation that will not be destroyed. Jesus Christ is our foundation. But everything upon that foundation that you've built and lived as a Christian will be tested by fire. Wood, hay, or stubble, or whether you built out of precious jewels, gold, and so forth. It's all going to be brought to the forefront. And whatever's left, whatever's left is your reward. Lord, help me not to have to stand there with a handful of ashes and say, Lord, you died for this. But help me to live in this present age, this ungodly age. Because we live in an ungodly age. Anytime you can get this close to to fulfilling the book of Revelation in a world that we live in, it's an ungodly age because it's a world that has separated itself from God, that has set itself up under the authority of man, that has given itself to the, to the, to the lust of, of, of a demonic being of that Lucifer Satan, that one who was a covering sheriff who desired to overthrow the throne of God, wants to set himself up as the ruler of this world, and this world is given open-handed for that to happen. When we see that happening, when we see the way for the Antichrist being paid, it ought to scare you to death. It just tells us that we're much, that much farther away from, from living in a society that is a godly society. We ought to live soberly, righteous, righteously, and godly in this present world. So first of all, our salvation. Why we're here? To live for Christ. Amen. To live for Christ. But why we're here? Let's keep an eye turned up. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now you know, turkeys and chickens and Birds that are kind of ground-oriented. Uh, there's other birds that kind of fly around the atmosphere that, that would uh, kind of like to have them for lunch. Big old red-tailed hawk or something sitting out there watching the chicken, watching them little chicks run around out there. If you'll watch them, and you'll find it in geese, you'll find it, they've always got that one eye up. They got that one eye. What are they looking for? Well, they're looking for the, something that's coming from up above. Now, the one they're looking for is coming up above, it's coming down to eat them. <laughs> be a good reason to, to think about looking for them. But the one we're looking for loved us. Yes. And pulled us up under his wings so that the one who devours us can't find us. Nice. Amen. He hides us under his wings. He hides us under the shadow of the cross. He hides us under the blood. And one of these days, he's going to split open those heavens and he's going to say, just like he said to John out there in the book of Revelation, come up hither. And folks, the saints are going to lose their gravitation. We're going to go up. The saints that have already passed are going to come down with him. We're going to have a reunion in, 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 in the presence of our Savior like you've never ever thought of about. Because he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. 
and purify in himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. What are you zealous about? You've not been saved by works, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, but it also tells you you've been saved unto good works. Are you zealous for those good works? Are you zealous about having Christ alive in your life? Are you zealous about having the joy and the love of God fill you? Are you, are you zealous about, about the, the, the knowledge that Christ has redeemed you from all of your sins, from all of your iniquities, that you'll never stand before Him uh, ever one time in doubt or fear of your salvation? Because He loved you enough to demonstrate that love upon Calvary, to die for you, and He had the power to conquer not only sin, but death itself, and to offer to every person who receives Him eternal life. Are you zealous about that? Are you zealous about the church? Jesus said, I've come to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. Now I know about the local church and the body uh, universal. I know, I know all of that, but every, every church is a visible church. He, just, he didn't write to, to the invisible bodies of the church in the book of Revelation. He wrote to, to the church in Ephesus, the church at Samaria, the church at Pergus, the church... Church, the church, the church, the church. And you know, they represent the church at all ages. But he also looks down and says, there's my church, there's Sulphur Springs. They've set up and committed themselves one to another for a purpose of, of being zealous for the work that I've called them to. To worship me, to gather in, in corporate body, to praise me and to lift me high. To take upon the battle of this world, to send missionaries to places that they can't go, to send out tracts to people who will, who will take them from their hands and will read them, who are willing to tell somebody about me. And one of these days, He's going to redeem us. We're going to be called up to be in His presence forever and ever and ever. But make sure you get the first thing first. Yes. Make sure you get salvation. Yes. Make sure you get salvation. There is no other name given unto him whereby men must be saved. Amen. Jesus Christ is the only way. Only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man, no man, no man, no man comes to the Father except by me. If you don't go through Jesus, you ain't getting you ain't getting there. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to confess that we love you. We're so grateful, Lord, that you were willing to give yourself to redeem us from our iniquities. Lord, I think of the depth of my own sin. I think of all the unrighteousness and the ungodliness that I did. Father, I think of the unsober lifestyle that I lived. And yet, Father, you love me enough to give yourself to redeem me from that life. I'm so grateful for that, Father. I pray, Father, that I might adorn the gospel in a right, godly manner. Father, I pray that my life would be honoring to you. Father, I pray the life of this church and the people of this church. I pray, Father, that the work and the ministry of our lives and of our homes and of this church would glorify and honor you. But Father, there's a lot of people who haven't got the first thing first yet. Father, they're still trusting their own goodness, their own way, their own life. They've not fallen upon the grace, your glorious, wonderful grace, as their only hope and means of salvation. Father, they're trusting everything else but the blood. I pray, dear God, today that your hearts would be tendered. Father, that they would yield to you, that they would know what it is to rest totally and completely in your finished work. We love you, Lord. I pray, Father, today your word will have good root and soul in people's lives. Father, I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, amen. First things first, that's salvation in Christ. But it don't stop there. 
live for Christ. He's worthy. One of these days, when you see Him, you know, we're all, I, I, you know, I tell you, I'm ready for Christ to come. Amen. I am. My physical body says, you know, I'm done with this world. <laughs> but then I get to thinking about seeing Him. And I'm thinking, oh me, Lord, I don't want to go there with empty hands. I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there with empty hands. Now I'm going to go. It may be with empty hands. But I'm going to go because first things are first. Yes. The blood of Jesus has cleansed me from all unrighteousness. Redeemed yes. me unto himself. I pray that's true. God bless you. You're dismissed.